Um, thanks everyone for joining us tonight. My name is Kevin. I'm one of the event hosts here at Powell's Books. And before we begin, I want to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website at powells.com. And if you don't already do so, please follow us on social medias, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, as well as our YouTube channel. Tonight, we're very excited to welcome Laura Coates in conversation with Soledad O'Brien. When Laura Coates joined the Department of Justice as a prosecutor, she wanted to advocate for the most vulnerable among us, but she quickly realized that even with the best intentions, the pursuit of justice creates injustice. Through Coates' experiences, we see that no matter how fair we try to fight, being black, a woman, and a mother, our identity is often at odds in the justice system. She and her colleagues face seemingly impossible situations as they teeter between what is right and what is just. On the front lines of our legal system, Coates saw how black communities are policed differently. Black cases are prosecuted differently and black defendants are judged differently. How the court system seems to be the one place where, minor where minorities are overrepresented an unrelenting parade of black and brown defendants and numbers that belie the percentage in the population and overfill American prisons. Through the revelatory and captivating courtroom scenes in her book, Just Pursuit, A Black Prosecutor's Fight for Fairness, Coates explores the tension between the idealism of the law and the reality of working within the parameters of our flawed legal system. Coates will be joined in conversation by Soledad O'Brien, award-winning documentarian, journalist, speaker, author, and philanthropist. She's the host of Matter of Fact with Soledad O'Brien and also busy at work with her own company, Soledad O'Brien Productions. This evening's event will include an audience Q&A. Please use that Q&A button that's at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question at any time. And if someone has typed a question that you'd like to know the answer to, you can even upvote that particular question. Perhaps most importantly, please support Laura and Powell's by purchasing a copy of Just Pursuit from us. A link to buy that book will be shared in the chat a couple of times this evening. Laura, Soledad, we're so excited to welcome you both tonight. Thank, Thank you so much. I will take it from here. Laura, so nice to see you. I wish we could be in person, but we will, we will just manage to do it remotely. Uh, the book is amazing. And uh, my understanding is now you're a New York Times bestselling author with I this am. book. So big congratulations. How does that feel? Uh, surreal, very surreal. You know, it's, it's having this very personal book out there. I was very nervous about writing it. I was sometimes regretting and thinking, have I gone too personal? Have I really gone there? Am I, should I pull back and do sort of the legal law school educational textbook? But I gotta tell you, I'm, I'm really so humbled and overwhelmed by the response it's gotten. And, and thank you for being here tonight. You have a thousand places you could be and I've always Not looked up to you in your career. So thank you well, for doing that. It's my pleasure and my honor. What a joy to be talking about your book, which is an excellent read. But I'm interested in how you thought about it. I mean, if you're saying as you're even writing it, you're anxious about the personal nature, why not do what I'm going to guess 98.999% of lawyers uh, and prosecutors who write books do, right? They, they do do the textbooky, you know, here was my, my read on American justice and not so personal. Yours goes a very different direction. Why? It does. And I think that it was so intentional to do so, even though it was scary. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not somebody who has done most of what I've done in my life because I'm fearless. I do it in spite of being afraid. I do it because I think it's important. And for me, I was very intentional about having a narrative memoir and having every chapter stand alone episodically and personify the issues we're all talking about in the national zeitgeist. And here I am on CNN and commenting and talking about what the law is and how to interpret it how it is interpreted, as opposed to what the law feels like, mm. the tangible aspects of it. What is the pursuit of justice really like? And I think in a world where we want to speak truth to power, people first ought to know what the truth is. And myself, I've always been drawn to storytelling. And that's the way I learn. It's the way I feel. It's the way that I grow, I hope, empathy and others do as well. And so I wanted people to really come along on a vicarious journey with me and see the chasm for themselves between what is right and what is lawful 
between where your moral compass points one direction and the directors are given in a different way, what do you do? You say in the, right in the very introduction, uh, which I think everybody just heard a moment ago, the pursuit of justice creates injustice. That seems so contradictory. Can you explain that? And it also seems like a massive obstacle to overcome if you're actually in the pursuit of justice. Well, you know, it does seem very counterintuitive to people that how can that be? But I think it's because we often, so with dad, think about justice in a very binary way. We think about a trial and a verdict. We think, okay, you pursue justice by trying to get a guilty verdict and you fail in your pursuit if you get an acquittal, for example. But justice is not that binary. There is really everything that happens in between, kind of like that paraphrasing John, Len John Lennon, life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. Collateral damage is what happens when you think about the end justifying the means and the pursuit of justice. And so when you think about it that way, I wanted people to really understand. I give many examples. I start the book out with an example. You know, I, I in my commentary, I suffer no fools and I don't exclude myself. From we love you. That's why we well, love you. <laughs> well, thank you. But I, you know, in this book, I I I wanted to really be introspective about the roles that I had played in this system as well. And I, I think about the way in which in this, I begin the book talking about a case with a man named Manuel, who was a victim of a car theft. He reported the crime as we want people to report crimes. But when he did so, and I had his case and ran a background check as part of the trial preparation of a newly inherited case, it pinged that he had an active deportation warrant. And as our office required and the protocol is, a warrant is a warrant is a warrant, which means that you must alert the authorities, and aid in any way you can in that person being detained. Now, in this case, it would have led to him being deported ultimately and having ICE contacted. And I can tell you, I really struggled with that, not to make it seem as though what I was struggling in any way is on the same level of what he personally was going through in those moments. But the pursuit of a conviction of somebody who had stolen this car, who had a legitimate rap sheet that was the kind that you would want this person to be held accountable for, that in pursuing a conviction against this person, there was going to be an inherent unfairness and injustice. They would be looked at, uh, upon as the same type, if at all criminal. And it, you know, you think about all the instances where the impact of our policies create these almost impossible scenarios. I mean, imagine if this was a sexual assault victim. The choice is what? To come forward and alert or continue possibly being victimized or have this person commit a crime again, or if you're denied wages or you are the family of a homicide victim, let alone the person who goes outside their house one day to find their car, to go to work and sees it's not there. And we have this impossible scenario where it's either you can do what people would like the society and report the crimes, or you face your biggest fear being realized. And I write the book in a way that you might find, well, there was no alternative. I had colleagues say, tell them to run, Coates. Don't put that on your conscience. Others saying you can, but you'll be disbarred as a result. Others saying, what do you care? You're a prosecutor and the law is the law and they don't have clean hands, but nothing is ever that simple. And you know, when your moral compass points one direction and the orders are given a different way, I think it might surprise you who you will be in that moment. Tell everyone in the audience what you did ultimately. Ultimately, I was required to alert the authorities and have to stand beside him as I tried to run it up the chain, even, even including the possibility of even asking, can, can we dismiss the case? I knew that wasn't going to be possible. I knew that wasn't going to be the outcome, but just in an attempt to do all that I could to try to figure out how to correct the injustice, and ultimately having security detail me to ensure that I would in fact be present and ensure the authorities were alerted. And the fear I watched of watching this man as I held his own cell phone up to his ear, calling his wife, trying, he asked me to contact his pastor, his wife, to let them know what had happened, what was happening and watching members of ICE and law enforcement belittle and assume that I would be a part of the us versus them it was something that I will never forget and continue to question um, my decision that day to do what was required, but not what was right. When did you start writing this book? 
you know, I journaled when I was in the office just as sort of a cathartic sort of therapeutic measure to sort of get the things off of my brain and to avoid it from penetrating. You know, a lot of things I, um, I take very deeply and personally in this book shows a lot of that. And so I would sort of take notes to try to get myself, you know, a way to process what was happening. But ultimately I began writing um, more, you know, furiously as the summer of unrest was unfolding and prior to that and thinking about here I was having the conversation on CNN about what was going on and having my own children like like many of you who are working from home I was broadcasting from home a great deal and I had my children who were distance learning thank goodness that's over but they were distance learning and they'd be looking up at me and they'd say mommy I just heard you heard you say that um George Floyd called for his mom would you come for me if, if, if I call for you when that happens? You think about unpacking that question, the inevitability of a child looking up at you thinking and not being able to parse out or compartmentalize and seeing, would you come for me if I was in his circumstance, resonating with that particular scenario? And I began to write even more um, and more thinking about how this was happening. And, and ultimately I wanted, it was equal parts catharsis and catalyst. I want to remind everybody, uh, if you have a question for Laura, when I'm done with our moderated conversation, uh, I will read your questions. I see some questions in the chat. We will not miss those, but I would prefer to have them thrown in the Q&A uh, area so I can see them all. So just a quick reminder, toss it right in there and I'll be sure to get to it. Why did you want to become a prosecutor? You know, I actually began in private practice, but always had a calling to go to civil rights division. I mean, I'm somebody who you know, growing up, my mother was raised in North Carolina and moved north with her family once my grandparents found work as domestic employees for some of the, you know, biggest namesakes of companies I later represented as an attorney. And my father grew up in Worcester, Massachusetts, and spent most of his childhood as a foster child. And although they were in very different scenarios, they both had similar experiences being young Black children growing up in the 1950s America. And so learning about through their eyes and through their, you know, extraordinarily impactful ways of teaching me about how the civil rights era was not to be confined to an era, that it was a concept of civil rights, that it was the idea of, of concluding and, and figuring out how to continue in that vein. And so I knew the stories of Ruby Bridges more than the stories of Dr. Seuss. I mean, I had on my wall, the Norman Rockwell painting of Ruby Bridges walking with marshals next to I dined underneath that in my living room. You know, we, we talk about the music, we would talk about the, the mission, we talk about the sung and unsung heroes of that era. And so I really always wanted to continue in that work and just revered the Charles Hamilton Houstons of the world and legal architects. And so when I had an opportunity to work in civil rights division, I jumped at it in the voting section are you kidding? I was thrilled. I had written my senior thesis on that very topic at Princeton on how to, you know, restore voting rights for former felons. Now you can imagine how that went over Soledad in the Bush Department of Justice when I, <laughs> I actually interviewed. But I was true about what I wanted to have accomplished. But I was really, um, so I was, I was technically a, a, a prosecutor in the Department of Justice. But I grew frustrated by the bureaucracy um, and wanted to have a more tangible role in the criminal and the justice system. And I thought, although under the same umbrella of justice, going to be in a, a sitting as a state's attorney in Washington, D.C. would be very similar. But I can tell you it was such a paradigm shift when I was in civil rights oh, division. You mm -hmm. know, it was it was a foregone conclusion, Soledad. Um, for who I was a champion, you know, the idea that you were advocating on behalf of those whose rights had been infringed or were seeking to have infringed, those who, um, you know, were marginalized, your allegiance was assumed for the right cause. As a criminal prosecutor, it was perceived very differently. People perceived it as a, betray a betrayal in some respects, even though your victims were black and brown, the parade of black and brown men and women into the courtroom as criminal defendants somehow made my very presence where people thought the white man, the man would be as something that called into question, whose side was I on? And that was jarring for me. You said you've always liked storytelling. Is that how you thought about your role as a prosecutor or any time you're, you know, I don't know that people often think of lawyers as, as storytellers. 
So how, how did you think about storytelling and how you could use it? And how did you think about those stories that you knew eventually would find their way in, into your book because they were so, I guess, you know, they just, you felt them so deeply and you knew they had to be part of your storytelling. And yet I think lawyers are the consummate storytellers. They are the ones who bring the and synthesize information and try to use our case law. I mean, our whole system of law really is about precedent and building off of one story and analogizing and distinguishing from the last one. And so in that vein, while it might not occur to many lawyers, that's what we're doing. We, in fact, are storytellers and hoping to persuade the audience to see it through the eyes of the person who is our protagonist or antagonist. And um, when I thought about which stories to include, you know, I, I don't think that I was, I definitely was not consciously going through it as a prosecutor thinking about, oh, I'm going to write this down and have this be a story one day. And I'm going to, you know, flush it out even more. No, it was the idea of curating in a way of the thousands of moments and memories I've had. These were the stories that personified the issues we were all grappling with from mistaken identity to victim blaming and shaming of delayed sexual assault cases to what's happening in monitoring voting rights in a so-called, which we know is not true, post-racial America, to the ideas of what it's like for privilege and race and bias to weigh in, to even peeling back the curtain of the grand jury. And for, for some of these stories, when they, when they they were pouring out of me, Soledad, because they are the stories that I turn over in my head through insomnia. The mm. moments that I, that, that sort of jars me out of my sleep and I, I try to process what has happened and, and wonder what might have been or should have been. And these were the stories that, I mean, if you, if you saw me writing these, these stories and, and writing it, I mean, there'd be moments I was actively reliving it. There'd be moments I was crying and my husband would say, you gotta take a break. Or my daughter would say, mommy, um, what's wrong? And my son would say, I think mommy's remembering again. Mm. That's how impactful some of these moments have been. It was difficult to write, but then there are moments of extraordinary, um, you know, things of triumph and joy at the exercise of humanity that I would see from other people as well. And, and, and that needs to be shared as much as the negative. Did you start, I guess, um, questioning the criminal justice system when you first started working in it, as you wrote the book, was that a moment where you, you know, sometimes as you're re-remembering stories, you begin to kind of see it with a new set of eyes and thinking like, oh my gosh, I can't even believe that I was in the middle of that. Um, where was the point where you began to really, maybe questioning is not quite the right word or, or maybe it is, but really rethinking like all that we think we know about how justice is meted out in this country. You know, it's an excellent question. And I think the word question is exactly what it what happened. I mean, there was the, the safe distance being able to process you know, I was several years out before I really started to really write and 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 make it um, this particular project. And so that distance gave me the sort of safety of reflection and also allowed me to strip the ego from what role I would have played in the sense that, you know, we all have in our in our own minds perhaps it's human nature to try to self-aggrandize, do the Al Bundy version of how we were in a moment, right? We all think about, we're all, we were all Olympians in our mind telling our kids when we played sports. In reality, 99% of us were not really that good right now. I, I happen to think I was a damn good lawyer, but the distance of being able to look, I wasn't trying to, and I'm not trying to self-aggrandize. I'm trying to tell the truth of what happened and what it looks like. And, um, and what this chasm can feel like. But I also you know, am, am very cognizant of, it didn't take the distance of having left to see the flaws. It's one of the reasons I did leave. Mm. And it, it was a moment in time, frankly, that was sort of the last straw for me that broke the camel's back when I had a supervisor come and watch uh, a verdict be rendered, which was not unheard of. And, in the hallway, he casually said and gave me a high five, we got another one. Now, not we got a guilty verdict or justice is served, but we got another one. What do you think, what do you think that supervisor meant by that? You know, I, I would love to extend the benefit of the doubt and think it means that he meant a guilty verdict, but it felt like an indoctrination in many respects or the completion of one where it was the us versus thems of the black and brown defendants. And it was shocking for me to be perceived as the us in the scenario. 
And I got to tell you, it, it was something that I, I, I wrestled with, but I also felt, to be honest, the second I set foot in the criminal courtroom, I mean, I remember turning to a colleague of mine who was, you know, when you first go in, it's really baptism by fire. You, know, you, you walk in, there's 75 cases, it's your first day in, and they go, go, go tell that you're now on behalf of the people of the United States, figure it out. And I remember looking at these 75 matters in front of me and looking around and, and turning to my colleague and saying, where are all the white people? And him saying, on the bench, Coates. And in that moment, I felt like it was and I, going from, you know, I know we don't have the monopoly on crime and Washington DC is not majority black. And yet I knew my officers were black and brown. And yet I can't, I can count on one hand of all the matters I saw over those years, the number of white defendants I ever saw in the courthouse. I mean, it really, I equate it to the distinction between knowing something and understanding something. I mean, you know about disparate impact, you know about mass incarceration, you know about the 13th Amendment and the evolution from there, you know about these aspects. But until you're there, it's like being on a train platform, you know? you know the ferocity of a train, you know when those pistons start going, you know the speed it can go. But when you're on that plane, that train platform and one actually whizzes by you, it takes your breath away when you feel the reverberations and you see it in, in, in person. That's what it was like day one. Hmm. Uh, there's a, a question from uh, Mr. McCall and uh, he put it in the chat and then he kindly moved it over to the Q&A for me. So thank you, Mr. <laughs> Paul. Uh, and it's a great question. And I think it's a good time to ask this question. So again, anybody who has a question, feel free to throw it into the Q&A. And if there's a moment that I think is okay to ask this question, I'll just, I'll just go, uh, go for it. Uh, he says this, a disclaimer he starts with, I've ordered your book, but I haven't received it yet. So he's, he's just saying, I, your book is coming, but I haven't read it quite yet. Uh, his question is this, whether at any time due to the ethical implications of the actions you're expected to take, did you ever consider resigning from your position as a prosecutor? Yes, I did multiple times. I really? I considered it after the instance with the man I told you about, Manuel. And oh. I came to the conclusion that I would be better serving justice by having the insight and perspective I brought and remaining within the system to work in a way that I thought furthered justice. It didn't mean that it was easy or that I didn't have moments that I thought, I don't know that I can do this any longer. There felt, but there was equal parts of me that felt it would be cowardly to leave or cowardly to remain. And I had to judge that for myself. Ultimately, I did end up leaving the Department of Justice, as you know. And when I did, I had come to my personal conclusion that I was, would be furthering justice by using education and information as a form of activism, by removing the muzzle and speaking about what I saw, the old, the old see something, say something. But there are moments and certainly certain cases come up in the media and I go, God, I wish I was the prosecutor on that case. <laughs> Man, I wish I was the prosecutor on that case. And then that little voice on the holder says, Coates, if you were the prosecutor of that case, you can't say what you say right now about that case. <laughs> you can't say what you're saying right now about that case. Um, but I, 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 rest, I wrestled with that. But you know, that's, there's a chapter in the book talking about the idea of having a confrontation Verbal only, of course, I'm a peaceful person, but a verbal confrontation with a defense counsel who approached me, a black woman, who thought that I um, had the nerve, the audacity to believe that I was a proponent of civil rights and yet still a prosecutor. And shouldn't I be a defense attorney if I believed in civil rights? And we equally thought we were at the right seat at the right table me believing that I was proactively exercising discretion in a way that I felt honored civil rights and her in a way that was more reactive, but as a uh, being able to check and balance the system. And so I think we have to disrupt this fallacy that black and brown people can occupy but one role in the criminal justice system, that of defendant or possibly defense counsel. We've got to access and be available and be present in the entire ecosystem of a legal system that is aspiring to be a justice system. But it sounds exhausting. And it, I wondered the degree to which it wears you down day in and day out when you try to walk that line or figure out where the Venn diagram overlaps. Maybe that's a better metaphor between idealism and reality. Yeah. 
you know, I think if you start off thinking like, oh, the idealism is the reality, and then pretty quickly that's put to bed. It, is, it was exhausting, but I had no right to be tired um, in some of the cases we were working on. I mean, we're, we're still talking about obviously the, the intellectualism of this, but then there's also, but these were people, human beings who were victims as well. And although they weren't my private clients as they have in private practice, I was still Laura Coates on behalf of the people of the United States. The interesting aspect people don't realize is when you say that, it necessarily includes the defendant as well. They are a person of the United States whose rights must be honored. There is a presumption of innocence. There is due process that's required. I am privileged by being, by virtue of being an extension or perceived as an extension of law enforcement and granted the benefit of the doubt that you may have heard people say, well, they wouldn't have arrested the person had they not done something. They wouldn't be prosecuting had the person not done something. And how quickly that presumption of innocence goes out the window but in a, in a funny way, it's all down, I'm sure you can relate. It prepared me for the media. Mm. It prepared me for those same notions of the sort of moral conundrums and ways in which you are going to relay and convey information and how you wield the power that you have and the responsibility for truth telling. Uh, chapter five of the book, um, you reference a case where you have a defendant who uh, had the evidence to prove that he wasn't the guy he was accused of being. And for people who haven't read it yet, it, that's a little complicated, but just take my <laughs> word for it. And you apologize to the gentleman and the judge says this, I guess the exception proved the rule today. You must be proud of yourself, Ms. Coates. What, explain the case briefly, but then what was the judge? What, what do you think the judge meant by that? Well, this was a case where a man was professing his innocence, that he was not the person who had savagely assaulted a woman that he had allegedly fathered a child with. And he was professing his innocence. He had a defense counsel who was at his wit's end trying to, but ultimately sort of concluded, well, I guess we tried. And the judge was berating and mocking him because she thought it was funny that somebody tried the, it wasn't me, and had hardened the prospect that perhaps it wasn't him and hope that I would in a moment and attempt to ingratiate myself with her. She hoped that I would want to ingratiate and that I would join in on the mockery. But the dynamic of seeing this black man, this white woman judge asking me to participate in mocking against the presumption of innocence was, was too much for me. And it wasn't even having to go the extra mile. I thought that what if what if the cops got it wrong? What would it take to have this sort of blink moment of not extending the carte blanche and benefit of the doubt? And as the chapter unfolds, you learn that of how little was actually required to confirm he was telling the truth, how little was required in that, in that instance. And when I came back to present to the judge what we had discovered and the ease of which, when she made that statement, I think perhaps she thought that this person professing her innocence, this mistaken identity proves that they overwhelmingly get it right. I don't know how perverse of a notion that she thought she realized that was, but you can just think about all the instances we hear in the headlines and the news all the time. You often hear about the exonerated, right? After all the time, and you hear about the person given a paper bag, bus fare, and hoping the people who were who knew that person when they went into prison, sometimes decades earlier, will be there when they get out. And then everyone goes, oh, I hope they're compensated for their inconvenience. And you wonder, how does it get to the point where that has happened? What were all the blink moments where somebody could have said, actually, perhaps they did get this wrong. I mean, just last week, there was a man in, I think, New Mexico who was, in, who was incarcerated for what, six days? Same name, I believe, but the person they were, this is a black man, Right. Person they were black and young, and the, black and the young. actual guy they were looking for was older and white, twice his age. I mean, and yet this is how easily it can happen. And so, you know, I don't know what rule she thought, but it. I took exception to the notion that officers always get it right. What do you think reform looks like? And is that different than when you got into working as a prosecutor and you had, uh, you know, I think we all get into jobs and think, well, if I ran this place here, here's what I would do differently. And I'm curious if that has changed over time, how you think what real reform in the criminal justice system would look like. 
you know, yeah, if I were in charge, the world is a, is a common preface for so many people these days thinking about what we would do. You know, I think the first thing is to recognize that you cannot confine any conversation about justice reform to simply a police interaction. Mm -hmm. I'm not denigrate, relegating that as being dismissive, but if you only focus on what's happening in terms of a police encounter, you are missing the huge iceberg under the water that includes the idea that we have to pay for the presumption of innocence in this country and the way in which one's socioeconomic status can dictate your ability to even present a defense. Talk about the way the Supreme Court has judicially created doctrines like qualified immunity um, making it nearly impossible to bring a, a litigation against a police officer because they're not on sufficient notice, so to speak, they believe. Or the idea of having the Supreme Court, I think in a Graham versus Connor decision, decide that you have to judge an officer's behavior through a reasonable officer standard rather than a reasonable person standard, which again, creates a, a, almost an insurmountable burden for being able to have people accountable let alone aspects of databases or tying um, federal funding to dashboard cameras and body cameras. I mean, there's all aspects you can actually focus on to take into consideration this whole ecosystem, but maybe you can just start at the very least, Soledad, with changing the mascot, so to speak, of the Department of Justice. This blindfolded woman who apparently if you see nothing, then everything will work itself out in the end, as if we are a colorblind society, as if, us ignoring the truth before us will lead to just conclusions as if every aspect of the American of American history has been impacted and infected by race, racism and bigotry and bias, but somehow this is the one area where it, it it's no longer relevant. We have to start thinking about the truth. Do you think those things are beginning to change? Are you optimistic when it comes to reform? Because personally, just from the journalism side of it, I've really seen a difference in how much we necessarily put 100% credence in the, the press release that comes from the police department, especially when they are an interested party in what they are self-reporting. But there was a time, and I did it as much as anybody else, right? They get a press release, here's what happened, I type it up, you know, and it's like, here's the police are telling us what happened. I think certainly journalists are beginning to say, huh, maybe there's some question we need to think about, you know, the point of view of the interested parties. Are you beginning to see a, a change? I, I know we're not at the change, but are you beginning to see a change in, um, in these things that you point out as reform? I think the clouds are breaking up. I, I do see sun rays coming through in that respect, because one, there is that healthy level of skepticism where People are no longer, you know, relegating stories of injustice to anecdotes. They're not just saying, oh, well, that happened there, it's isolated. They're seeing the connective tissue for all of these aspects of it. And we have citizen journalists in a way who are holding up a mirror literally or a cell phone camera in case of my home state of Minnesota and what happened with George Floyd and actually showing the world so if you had doubts about what was going on, if you had reason to question, for example, that press release that came out from the, um, the death of George Floyd initially, as was well, the death of George Floyd, that press release versus what we actually saw happening. I think there are moments when people are at least now no longer willing to be dismissive of instances as anecdotes, but I think we still have some progress to be made in the political appetite to be able to codify the truth. And there is not always the political appetite to do so for a variety of reasons, maybe the power of unions, maybe because, maybe because it makes people feel safer to believe that our officers are infallible or our justice system is working exactly as it is. It should be because it's what we hold out to the entire globe as a beacon of hope about what justice in a democratic society can look like. And if we are confessional, about the truth, that we are still aspiring to be who we are on paper. Um, somehow, I think people feel that's reflected badly on the US. And so I think, you know, there are moments, but we have more room for confession and more room to actually make the changes based on the truth. Um, I'm curious if you um, are feeling uh, 
optimistic? I mean, are there things that you, what would be the thing that you think regular folks, those of us who are not prosecutors who don't work in the legal system, don't know about it? I am optimistic. I really, I mean, I'm, a, I'm an eternal optimist. I really am, not because I'm naive, but because what choice do we have? If I'm not an optimist, if I sort of resolve and just say, fine, nothing will change, then nothing will change. And sometimes optimism is extraordinarily unreasonable, but unreasonable people have changed this world a lot of times, not wanting to accept the status quo, not deciding that, well, this is inertia, how it is in motion is how it's always gonna be in motion. I think optimism can disrupt that, but it is almost like the notion of trust, but verify, be optimistic, mm -hmm. but work, right? That's how I where I think we are. And for most people, I think a lot of this is just acknowledging that, you know, in a nation of laws, how many times have we heard that recently? In a nation of laws or thinking about equal protection of the law, or who it applies to or who's above the law or not above the law. We can't just have the indignation and pearl clutching as it relates to those who are office holders. If you have that same indignation and the idea of the unequal application of the law or protection as it relates to some of our most pivotal figures in our political system, you ought to have the same consistency about what happens to people who are not getting the limelight and the attention as well. And so we have to take in many ways the um, productive anger that comes from looking at a system and wondering why it's not what it's supposed to be and knowing we can change that in, in the, the less high profile scenarios, which is frankly where 99.9999% of the cases really are. A uh, couple of questions that come right out of that answer. Uh, sure. So I'm gonna turn to, we've got uh, Farah has asked this question. As a black high school student, how do you advise many people like me to try to find their voice when trying to help combat systemic racism in this country? It's so interesting. That's a question I hear from a lot of young people, yeah. which is, um, I think sometimes it makes me feel bad that we foisted that, which is a big ask onto a bunch of young people. Um, but I do think they have the energy and probably the ability to do it. Well, you have more energy than I do these days. <laughs> I'll, tell you, I'll tell you that, but no. First of all, I'm glad you asked the question and I'm already so proud that in high school, you're thinking about these issues and wondering how you can be the change and not waiting for one to arrive and knowing that you are that person. So bravo to you on that. Um, I think that there is a tendency, particularly when you're younger, we all have a tendency to try to conform to be what we think we're supposed to be in order to fit into a definition either of an activist or a lawyer or um, a member of Congress or a teacher or just who you are, right? And I think we, when we do that, we choose to conform, we leave, we lose the best parts of ourselves and perspectives that can actually change the things for the better. And so I would just tell you unapologetically, bring yourself into every single room that you walk into. It won't always be easy, but you have to bring yourself in because the world is better because you precisely are in it. I mean, there's also a common phrase like, you know, just be yourself. Everyone else is already taken. Well, I want to hear from you about what you see through your personal storytelling, through your experiences, through the things that you look at and say, this is not the way it ought to be. Because asking those questions about why is this the way it is, I hope you're not waiting always for the answer. I hope you are using it as a challenge and telling people who are set in their ways, my question was actually rhetorical because it should not be the way that it has been. And so ask the questions, ask, you know, provide the answers if you can search for them, but in everything you're doing, just bring yourself and all that you are into it. And I, I guarantee you that any room you're in will be better for it. This is a question from Kendra and she says, do you, did you struggle to find like-minded colleagues in the office? Now, I'm not sure which office exactly she's referring to, but maybe she means in the, in the office as a prosecutor. You know, I have to say, I um, certainly had colleagues that I did not respect at all, that I think should not have had the privilege of representing people of the United States of America. But I also had the real privilege of having extraordinary colleagues who had and faced and grappled with the same moral conundrums that I was, that I was facing and grappling with. 
and often looking to them and we sometimes commiserate, sometimes swap ideas or think about, or even just having moments where we're listening about, here's what I just experienced and what do you think about this and what can we do? And it made it for an environment, frankly, where it was less of a patchwork of individual prosecutors with their own agency and discretion, willing, willing their power as they saw fit and could be a more uniformed approach to justice in those moments. Um, and normally that came from people who were black and brown in the office, but it also came from those who frankly were civil rights proponents. And I, I want people again to, to get away from this notion of either you can be a proponent of civil rights or a prosecutor. You've gotta be both if you have the audacity to ask for the opportunity to represent people of the United States of America. And I certainly had colleagues who I was very proud of and to this day are, including officers who served valiantly and continue to do so. I write about instances where I was proud and I write about instances when I, when I was not and I tell the truth the same way. Uh, this uh, question is from Pringy. I'm a huge fan of you both, thank you. Uh, thanks for putting on this webinar. I'm feeling hopeless these days with respect to the law and how it's applied disproportionately. What are you seeing within the criminal justice system and the way the law is adjudicated that gives you hope? Well, I too am a fan of Soul Dad O'Brien, so that's number one. <laughs> I'm a huge fan of hers and she knows that. So, um, I, you know, what, what gives me hope is that there is a consistent microscope. You know, if you, if you look and how, how many times stories have left the headlines, and certainly they, the cameras do go away, that's true, but there is a consistent drive to see America for what it is and to explore that and a, a real aversion to having whitewashing be the, the lay of the land. And I think that's extremely, that gives me hope because it tells me that people, there's an appetite for truth. And if there's an appetite for truth, then perhaps we could one day, I mean, I'm, I'm selfish, I admit it. And I'm, I'm sure you are in a way too, Soledad. I'm very selfish. I got a seven-year-old and a nine-year-old. And God, I, I want my kids by the time they're my age to be talking to their children about all of these aspects in a history book, as opposed to the evergreen perpetual conversations I know my parents had, I know their parents had, I know their parents had. And um, I think this gives me hope that a cycle of accepting the status quo, if it ever occurred, would really be broken. And I, I think there's agency, especially the younger people, but also I don't see the same generational conflicts about you know the finger wagging of you don't know any better and how dare you ask for change and take your time. That seems to be dissipating as well, which gives me even more hope. Do you miss practicing law? That's a question from John. Um, sometimes I miss, um, particularly for the, some of these cases where they are just evoked such a visceral reaction. I wish I could play a bigger role in ensuring a conviction. I tell you that. Um, but I also really enjoy the work I'm doing because it allows me to um, have a, a, a broader reach in the sense of being able to help people understand and, and peel back the curtain and understand the, what I think oftentimes people mistake to be esoteric and highbrow. And I, I hope that by making the law more accessible and, and having people feel like it's, that, that, that politics is the same way and having credibility in those areas, I, I think that I still practice law in a different form. Of all the stories that you tell in your book and you tell a lot, what do you think is the hardest? What's the toughest story that you tell? <sighs> you know, one of the hardest stories is the, um, of a young girl who accused her, really her stepfather, for lack of a better term, of rape and watching the victim blaming come down from a judge. You know, this is an era we all live in and this Me Too era we talk about of believe women. And what that looks like in the court of public opinion and what's professed in a court of public opinion versus what actually happens in a court of law, um, it's mind boggling that we have not progressed where we need to be in this world. And it's difficult because sometimes much, much like I experience in the law, 
as a prosecutor in particular, you are able to have a greater predictive value of how things are going to go. For example, when I would get a case, it would come to me, the better I got, it was almost um, disappointing because I knew that the better I was at my job, the less of a chance for due process fully or a viable defense could ever be raised. The same notion took place in the sense of watching a young girl walking down the courtroom aisle to take the witness stand and watching the judge with really venom coming out of her eyes of disdain for this young girl of how she dressed or how she, who she thought wasn't held to be a victim, knowing in that moment how this trial would end. Um, that same sort of prescient value or prescient notion was difficult to, to write because I think it's still very true to this day in so many ways. And um, I often wonder about if, if people consider the collateral damage and, and who is thrown away in the process of determining who has every right to be treated with dignity and who does not. And, and it was difficult to write, but I, I mean, there, there are moments I write, write about a chapter about secondary trauma as well, because you know I'm a human being, I'm, I'm not a robot. My mother always says, you're not a talking head, right? I'm not, I'm a, I'm a talking human being. And I, it might've been easier to approach my job robotically. Perhaps I wouldn't have felt the way I did, and because I didn't approach it robotically, I, um, I still have very difficult moments of the secondary trauma of remembering aspects of what has happened in cases. I, I have moments when I reflect um, through my children. And I remember a, a moment I write about in one of the chapters where I was able to compartmentalize so well until I had my first child. And um, I remember my son, my little boy, um, hearing him scream one day, a regular scream, and you know, a baby will scream, and being almost in the fetal position, because in that moment, it's, I said to myself, this must have been what it sounded like when that child screamed, when that baby screamed. And I have difficulty, even to this day at times, with insomnia and, and, um, and sort of being jolted from sleep about moments. And that's hard to write, because it's hard to admit that, um, I remain vulnerable or that I am some, at times overwhelmed even by things that ought to be in your past. And, but I'm human and, and writing that and conveying that can be difficult. Really good question. That's a good follow-up I think to that point it comes from anonymous attendee. Um, <laughs> <laughs> also like the name, Mr. Anonymous. <laughs> Uh, the injustice that unfolds due to prosecuting and or defending becomes a game rather than truth. How hard is it when you discover that someone is innocent, though you have to prosecute and that person might be found guilty? They're making it very black and white, but I have to imagine that in your career, there were a lot of grays. The very first story you told is sort of one. Um, you know, how do you, although it wasn't really about prosecution, um, but you know, I mean, you were saying it, right? Once you start prosecuting, it's gonna go down a certain path and the better you get, the less likely it is that it's gonna be necessarily a fair yeah. battle. Well you, well, you know, in the, in the, as part of discretion, if I believe someone's innocent, I'm not prosecuting them. That's, that's sort of the, the beauty of the power of being a prosecutor, right? There are, there are moments certainly when you, you may wish they had made a different choice or wish for a second chance, the individual, but the way evidence compels a result. But it's different than actually believing someone's innocent. If I believe somebody was innocent, I am duty bound. Again, the people of the United States includes the defendant. And I shouldn't be prosecuting somebody who I believe is innocent just to get a guilty verdict. That's unfair, it's wrong. It's, it's not becoming of the oath of office. Um, but there are certainly moments, frankly, when not just in terms of innocence, but the idea of, I want this person to make a different decision because you have a window for an acquittal. Mm -hmm. I write about in one chapter called Babyface um, about a, a young man who I, you know, he was, the name says it all, looked like a, a, a cherub, a child, frankly, but obviously was not. And there was a, I didn't believe he was innocent, but there was a way for him to undermine my ability to prove the case. And there was a window of opportunity if he, was, if he would have taken it. And sometimes people 
don't act in their best interests, even when that door is wide open for them and you're almost beckoning them to, to do what it would take. Um, and you know, in that, in, that, in that chapter, I talk about what that process was like and, and you can lead a horse to water, proverbially speaking, and not, and they, but they won't, it won't, you can't force it to drink. I don't mean to denigrate the person as a, as a, as a, um, as a horse, but the analogy holds that sometimes people will make decisions even when there's an opportunity for an acquittal if they don't know better or they don't want for some reason. And sometimes their choices will surprise you. Maybe it's the idea of street cred. Maybe it's the idea of, um, of being mistrustful that there is even a window. It's kind of like one of my favorite movies is Slumdog Millionaire. And I don't want to spoil it, but there's a scene that's very um, pivotal to the ending where he believes he can trust this person to act in their best interest, but it turns out he cannot. And he does not, and he's not trustworthy, but up to that point, you believe he is. And I wonder if at times the, the mistrust and distrust is so deeply entrenched in our relationships with the law and communities that people won't take opportunities they believe are traps because of that. Uh, Anonymous wrote this question as well, which is a good one. And I might tweak it a little. What are your thoughts on the critical race theory movement and how to combat it within the context of education? I think, you know, I might ask you to look at it through the prism of the law and the idea that that race and the law are intertwined and have been for a very long time. Now, I don't think anybody K through 12 is studying that at all, <laughs> uh, which is a whole other story. Uh, so I might move you off of the education part of that question, but maybe through the prism of the law. Well, look, I mean, I look at critical race theory as history, right? The impact of race in our country. I don't see why we would not want to teach people about it. I am always shocked and amazed by the idea that there's, that I, I certainly have learned about the suffrage movement and I learned about it from men as well. And yet we teach that and it doesn't seem to offend people to recognize that the rights of women were limited. Um, we talk about any, any notion of things. I'm not sure why this is the area where people feel as though it's toxic to show the truth. And I think, frankly, um, we would be better off acknowledging the truth than trying to save people's feelings about, for some reason, feeling blamed by the history of America and, tr and treatment of it. And it goes back to the idea of the, of the justice system as well, where acknowledging our shortcomings does not mean that we cannot take corrective action. In many ways, I think about the James Baldwin quote of, I love this country more than anyone else, any other country in the world, which is why I reserve the right to perpetually criticize it. You're not less of a patriot because you acknowledge where America has its shortcomings, and you're not less of a, in the pursuit of justice to acknowledge that injustice occurs. But if you ignore that it occurs, if you ignore the impact of race, if you ignore the impact of, um, of bias, if you ignore the idea that some people are motivated, in fact, even in hate crimes by race and other matters, religion, sexual orientation and the like, then how long do you intend a society to function and thrive comprised of ostriches with, with their heads in the sand? It doesn't, it cannot work that way. And if you are unwilling to accept where we are, then we were doomed not to say to repeat, we're doomed to remain exactly as we are. And, there, and our country needs to grow. And education and acknowledgement of what truly is can help us get there. What's your advice for lawyers? Uh, and maybe I'll say specifically black female lawyers. Oh, well, hello and welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I say my, my advice, honestly, is, as I've said in the past, to, to bring yourself. What I mean is, too, is don't shy away from exploring the battles of allegiance that you might face. Um, the questions that you're asking and raising and, and being introspective about are worthwhile, are valid, and need to be explored. And um, Black women in particular, I think we bring an extraordinarily valuable and distinct perspective to the laws in this country, which is why one of the reasons I'm a proponent of having a black woman as a Supreme Court justice. 
just look at the history of the black woman's experience in this country. I mean, certainly you had the 15th amendment, but it didn't actually really apply to women to the 19th amendment. And then another 45 years before Jim Crow took his talons out long enough to allow black women to be full participants in a democracy. And over that course of nearly a century, certainly it led to a varied experience among black women that I think cannot be overlooked. And I think it is infused our collective experience, although we're not a monolith, but a collective experience in being able to see America in part for what it is, the, um, the requirement of patience and the frustration with being asked to be. And um, I, I just think that black women and black women lawyers, there's a, such a beautiful intersection there. I mean, there's it's, it's no mistake, there's no coincidence, I would say that our first first lady was a black woman, our first woman vice president. Um, you know, we've had black women in the bar and, and since the 1800s and of course, and the bench for since the, since the early 1900s as well. And I, or late 19, excuse me. And I just believe that we bring such a beautiful perspective that we shouldn't shy away from. And I think that we should never, never be forced to silence ourselves because someone might be uncomfortable with their perception that you're playing a race card by pointing out the impact of race. Final question for you comes from Laura. Um, Laura. Beautiful name. Beautiful name. <laughs> What's next for you, Laura? I always feel like if you ask someone who's just churned out a New York Times bestselling book, uh, when they're writing their next one, it's like asking a new mom, what a cute baby, when's the next one coming? So that's not good. So we're not asking that, but uh, give us a sense of, um, of uh, there've been some big changes at CNN, what's happening on that front and what's ahead for you? Well, you know, um, I, I pivot like nobody's business. I'll tell you that. I, I really, I really do. And I, I really try to live by this, this principle of, you know, um, get up in the morning, go to bed at night and do what you love in between. And that's my, my personal view of success. So I feel very successful at being able to fill my days with um, the things that I value most and pri and scheduling my priorities, not prioritizing my schedule. And part of that includes more writing. I'm, I'm, I'm working all the time on writing more. And, um, and there's some exciting things on the, on the horizon in that respect. And of course, I continue with my work with CNN. I'll actually be anchoring this week um, at the, uh, and I fill in continuously still that, that way. And that's been a really, really, um, I think, important part of my own personal journey and development. Um, I know I try to emulate the Soledads of the world and all that you've done. <laughs> And, um, but I certainly, my, I will take storytelling to a different degree and, um, and I'm looking into more television and, and production and really having the, the storytelling at a different level. So we'll see what's next. That sounds like a lot and it sounds great. Laura Coates, congratulations on your new book. Yeah. It's called Just Pursuit and everybody uh, in the chat, there's a link on how you can buy this book from Powell's Books. So I hope you, uh, you will do that. A big thank you, such a pleasure to talk to you. And I'm gonna hand this right back to Jeremy uh, and Powell's Books Bookstore, which is in Portland, Oregon. Jeremy? Before you do, can I give a plug okay. for Soledad's incredible series and documentary series called Black and Missing? Can I, can we please talk about it for a second, yeah. Soledad? More, 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 it's yes. It's on H, it's like HBO Max. It's incredible because the work she does in terms of bringing things, that, her storytelling is always phenomenal. And this series is called Black and Missing and it explores in a whole different ball game and the way of thinking about it, the stories that are left behind and the collateral damage of those who are in the periphery. And it's incredible. So shout out to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll send it right back to you, Jeremy. Thank you so much, Soledad, for joining us. Thanks, Laura. This is the book right here, Just Pursued. I did put the link in the chat so you can check that out and click on it. Order from us, please. And also in the chat, I'm gonna post a link right there to our um, events calendar. And then we're also gonna post a chat for our YouTube channel. This event has been recorded and it'll show up on our YouTube channel. Uh, there's the link for that. Sometime tomorrow, if you have friends that missed out on it, you know, feel free to share it and uh, tell other people to check it out. So once again, thanks, Laura. Thanks, Soledad. Thanks, everyone at home for tuning in. And uh, have a great rest of your night. Good night, Thank everyone. You.